Welcome back to another episode of Shifted Podcasts. Um, this is a Learn Quebec production um, where we reach across our beautiful country, um, finding educators that have amazing things to tell. Um, and this is our second episode of this school year, uh, 2024, 2025. And I am so pleased to have Devry Kushar here with us from Saskatchewan, um, who does amazing stuff with connecting families to schools. And we're going to talk about a bit of that today. Um, so Debbie, thanks so much for hopping on here and joining us and uh, sharing a little bit about what you do. Oh, I'm honored by your words, Chris. Thanks for inviting me. I'm oh, really real pleased pleasure. to be here. I met Debbie. Um, we have a CLC conference, or we had one last year, and she came to present and I listened to her and walked right up to her and I was like, we got to do a podcast together. Mm -hmm. So here we are. Debbie, why don't we start off a little bit about a little background? Like, how did you get to what you're doing today in education? Right. You know, Chris, I was an educator for 15 years before I had a child of my own enter the school system. And so, you know, 15 years of being a teacher, a principal, a supervisor, you know, all those things, you think you know a lot about schools. Great. And then I brought my oldest son, Cohen, to kindergarten, five years of age, and I had twin sons in a stroller as well. So I was, I was at home parenting. And Cohen was really warmly welcomed into his school in his kindergarten that day. And I felt kind of pushed out the door. It's like, take those babies and off you go. Yeah, come back at 1118 or whatever time I was supposed to come back. And you know, it, it was like, boom, it was this huge awakening moment where I thought, is this what it's like for a parent on a school landscape? Because I thought I knew what it was like. And so for me, that was just the first of a multitude of unfolding experiences Cohen's first year you know, meet the teacher night, parent teacher conferences, all the things that we ask parents to do. And I just felt so marginalized. I felt unimportant, yeah. unheard. I felt like my knowledge wasn't wasn't invited. And and so that's that's what got me in this direction. It was it was really my own experiences as a mother. Well, and what were your steps to did you um, get into schooling for how to make that or was it just through experiences that you that you had yeah so i mean it was those experiences that caused me to think huh maybe it's time to take another course at university right i became really curious about it and and thought i'll just take a course and you know chris how it goes a course leads to a course leads to a program leads to a phd leads to a research agenda and here I am, 25 years later. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Anyway, Amazing. yeah. So my doctoral work focused specifically on the place and voice of parents on school landscapes. And that was the first, the first research I did in this area, which led to a number of other research um, interests and pursuits around parent engagement over the rest of my career. Had you had other um, parents talking about their experiences as well that you connect with that this wasn't just about my experience, that this is a common felt experience where, where families feel marginalized from the school? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we were expected to volunteer in our kids' kindergarten class, right? And many of us who are parents from different parts of the world, parents from different parts of the province, and, and it was like, you, you need to spend half a day in your child's classroom, but you can't bring your other children. Mm. And, and so there we were, we were all kind of saying, how do we make this work? And we started doing parent co-ops and you watch my kids while you go and then on my day. And, and, and so the conversation just evolved about what's happening here, right? What does this mean for us? Um, I joined the school council and still felt like really we went there, there was an agenda, there was a circle, an inner circle of parents who kind of knew the teachers, the rest of us kind of sat quietly and, and it just a lot of questions started to bubble up. And so then as you 
share those stories with other parents, you find your experience is not unique. It's, it's reflective of many other people's experiences. And even though I was white, I was middle class, I was educated, and I was an educator, I still felt like I didn't know how to navigate it. So, I mean, I had the ins and I still couldn't do it, right? And so then you start to say, well, what other systemic or structural things are going on here mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that maybe we haven't actually been researching or paying attention to? Right. And through your PhD work, what research do you, like, where does this all start from, Debbie? Like, has it always been separate, like family and school where they, they tend to be more, you know, separate? Like, has this been a long history in the educational system based on the research that you've done? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, we all have a little bit of a sense of where schools came from, why schools were needed. You know, it was that industrialization that happened across Canada and the world. It was that agricultural economy that needed people to be working on farms and in fields and needed kids to be safe. I mean, all of those things prompted the need for a structured system. And then within that system, I think this attitude became, thanks, drop them, we've got this. You go about your life, we'll go about our life. And, and we didn't question that sense of division or authority. But I think as as the world's changed and as research into this um, started, you know, Karen Mapp, Dr. Karen Mapp from Harvard Graduate School says, we have 50 years of research evidence that show that kids do better when their parents are engaged. And that's academically, socially, behaviorally, in terms of attendance, all of those factors. So I think by the time I started doing this research, it was a sense of, um, if we know this, why aren't we doing it? And what might that look like? And so my work has really been to explore where, when, how parents have place and voice or not. And then where I've really focused my energy is what could it look like? What do we do? What are some of the strategies and practices? Um, identifying it is important, but then where do we go from there, right? Yeah, putting action to it. That it's yeah, not. yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, education is kind of has that um, mark on it. I'd say of less action. You know, a lot of talking, and we have research. We have all the information right in front of us. Yeah. What are we going to do with it? And it's that step that sometimes gets forgotten. Well, it was interesting because, of course, my mom read my doctoral dissertation because she was a great mom and cared about what I did, right? Like, you're, I always say you're a parent birth to forever, right? So she, she was still interested in what I was doing. And, and the thing that she said afterward is, Deb, it's like your dissertation told my story. And I think, well, how can I tell, be telling a story of a generation ahead of me? right and and it's still resonating so what's not happening why is my mom's story my story and how do i make sure my story isn't my kid's story right, right? so like then it was breaking that kind of yeah cycle. yeah, yeah. yeah. when you're called kind of concept right that's you right. need you that's only right. when we ask for you otherwise <laughs> <people don't> come. <laughs> right, right. And if you look at the structure of, of school from like elementary up to high school, does it does it reduce? And I kind of saying this because I kind of know like from yeah. high school to elementary that it does, in fact. Yeah. Like high school is very like they won't even let you in the front door some of the times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what have you why is that shift happen? Like where it seems there's engagement in the preschool settings a bit more than you would see in a grade seven or eight class. Yeah. What's the mindset behind that, do you think, in, in the educational systems that we, that we have? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think there's often this assumption, well, by then, as kids get more independent, their parents are returning to the workforce, they don't have enough time, you know, all of that. But, but I actually don't believe that. I, I know that when my kids were in high school, they'd say, Mom, are you going to be at my football game? Mom, are you coming to? They wanted me to be there. And so what I think, Chris, is that there are a lot of myths that we perpetuate about our teens and, and what they want or don't want, what they need or don't need. 
um, you know, we often will say, oh, kids don't want their parents at that age. And I think they do want you. It's just mm -hmm. how that looks or in what context, right? Um, and, and I also think there's, there's this talk that we have about independence. It's time for them to cut the apron strings. It's time for them to become more independent. And so then parents are pushed out the door. And again, I think in the rest of the world, we don't promote independence, we promote interdependence. You and I are doing our work together today across the country. And I think that's, that's what we want, right? And so I think it's become just an excuse, right? It makes it easier if we're not dealing with parents rather than it makes it richer and, and we get better results when we work with parents. So I think at the high school level, we do have a lot of myths that we need to name, challenge, unpack, and really consider yeah. what it could look like. Um, there's a wonderful teacher here whom I've worked with, and he's a high school English teacher and department head. And he took some summer classes with me on parent engagement and, you know, sitting in a room full of, you know, early childhood educators, mostly he's like, well, I can understand how this works for all of you, but like, I don't know in my English class. Right. And, and so, you know, everyone had a project to do to say, how will I engage parents in teaching and learning? And, and Brett, Brett Rowland is his name. He created this wonderful strategy, this wonderful project within his English classes where students could do the novel study independently like they usually did, or they could engage in a parent student book club. And he developed this beautiful process where he offered books, um, parents and kids could go home together and talk about, do we want to do this together? What book would we like to read together? And then he created this lovely check-in structure where, for example, the first check-in was, um, go on video together and say, why did I want to read this book? And why did I, as, as parent, as child, and, and talk about our choice, talk about how we're going to read and when we're going to check in with each other. And then he has them do these interesting things Indi individually, each find a passage in the book that speaks to you in some way that you think reflects your family values or your values, and then get together and talk about it. And then find one that you think challenges it and, and talk about that. So he was doing this really neat work. What I love about it, Chris, is he's engaging parents in teaching and learning, which is where we know we have the impact. He isn't asking them to come to school. They're not sitting in their child's English class, right? And he's doing the work he would do anyway. It's not more work. It's just different. Like he, they were going to do a novel study and he just reframed it. So I think at a high school level, there are ways to use parent and family engagement that's age appropriate, that's exciting for both parents and teens, um, that, that helps the teacher gain knowledge about the child and the family, and that, as we know from the research, enhances their outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. It can be like that at a high school level, Yeah. right? You know you just made a bulb go off too when you said that like i have a high school um, graduating student in this series in grade oh, 11. Sweet. yeah he always wants he he's a part of the music program oh lovely. He, like he needs me at every show he's like you have to come and watch like and i never thought about that as family engagement but i mean that the, all the families go and they all cheer and and like support these kids you know, even if it sounds a little wonky sometimes, because mm -hmm. they're learning. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to remove myself from a classroom and see the school as a, as a whole, rather than, well, I don't get invited into his English class to, whatever or, you know, whatever yeah. it might be. But I think that those school opportunities are there. Um, See, what's, what's exciting to me, and I think was a light bulb for me too, Chris, is that we're talking about parent engagement with your child, with your child's teaching and learning. We're not defining parent engagement as parent engagement with your child's teacher or your child's school. Do you see the difference? 
Yes. So when you talk music at home, you listen to him rehearse, you choose songs he might play, you are engaged in his teaching and learning. And that's the parent engagement that, that the research is showing has impact, right? When you talk about what's on the news, when you talk about what's happening in your province, when you go on a vacation together, you wander into the library, all of that is parent engagement. Mm -hmm. And so can we be engaged with our teen kids? Of course we can, yes. right? And when we're recognizing that what we're doing is mattering, then we can even be more conscious and, and purposeful. You know, the, what was so fun one summer, I was teaching a graduate class in the summer and I was talking about Brett's book clubs and this teacher in my group got excited and she started to cry and she said, I was a mom in Brett's class. I got to do this book club with my son. And so just listening to it from her perspective. And then she, she came back a little while later because one of the things that I do in my in my graduate classes on family engagement is have teachers choose a novel to read and and use it kind of that family and that novel as their case study right mm -hmm. and and she came to to class one day and said you're, you're gonna love this my son saw my book lying on the counter and he said oh you have to do a novel study too do you want me to do it with you like how beautiful is that, right? <laughs> the reciprocity yeah. of that. And he saw the value enough that he said, hey, mom, you, you, you work with me on mine. How about I work with you on yours, nice. right? Like those are lifetime memories. They'll remember those experiences forever, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's really fascinating, Debbie, what you're, what you're saying. Like things are just sparking for me right now. Okay. Um, doors are starting to... They, you don't actually have to physically get into that school to show that you're involved with the learning of your child. You have to find occasions to talk, to share of what they're doing inside there and how you connect to that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, Sorry, go I ahead. was going to say, you know, and teachers can promote that just by asking questions, right? Yeah. Not by planning huge events, not by having special days not by you know all of the things that take time and effort that we typically don't have but just by saying hey we talked about this in class today ask your son or your daughter what what their thoughts were on it right it's it can be that simple and that is parent engagement and it does then connect the home and the school in that learning conversation right yeah, yeah amazing it's a redefinition, I think, or a reimagining. Yeah, yeah. And I can really see it as a, as a mindset shift. It's yeah. just how you see school. Like, and I know we all bring luggage from our experiences in school, yeah. but shifting them slightly, like you're suggesting, could have a huge impact on our kids. Yeah. And, and for me, too, you know, so often... I mean, I've been through many years of going to conferences, going to meet the teacher night, um, going to open houses, right? Le going to school council meetings. And, and like I said, felt really inconsequential in all of that, right? But, but I think if we can just consider that notion that it's about, it's about the learning relationship that's really important and how we engage in those conversations, mm -hmm. um, then it's not about just being a warm body at an event, but it's actually bringing my knowledge as a parent, it's bringing my experiences, it's, it's, it's creating this rich conversation with my own child. Mm -hmm. um, that's really what we're looking for, right? Um, the checkbox, how many people came to meet the teacher night is really not very important, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And how did you? How do you think that the pandemic either enabled a bit more parental mm -hmm. engagement, just because the kids were at home? Yeah. Or deterred? Um, have you seen a, a shifting at all um, since the pandemic has happened? Yeah, I, I I think it did both of those things that you've mentioned, right? I read an article and I wish I could remember who wrote it, that, that I should be giving credit to someone, but 
But there was a piece that I read that said in instances where teachers and schools had strong relationships with parents, those relationships strengthened through the pandemic because they really worked hard at maintaining them and, and enhancing them. For schools that did not have strong relationships in the first place, the gap got wider, hmm. right? So it's really about how much energy we're putting into building that relationship with one another. Um, I was working with a, a parent engagement facilitator in the Melbourne region of Australia and um, he was working with some schools there and they they did a little bit of research on what was happening and and where they are in Australia they don't do home visits many places don't um, and so what he said is parents spoke so positively about the look that they got how the pandemic created a window into their child's classroom because they were often not invited to be in the classroom or they were at work and couldn't be. And that teachers spoke so positively about, it was kind of like a virtual home visit, right? Mm -hmm. I got to know the family, more about their culture, more about what, the way they spend their time, how they think, the things they do. And so there was this sense of getting to know one another, you know, that, that hadn't been happening in real time. Um, so there was real richness to that. I think where the negative maybe came in, um, lots of parents were asked to be teachers of their children during the pandemic. Yes. They didn't sign up for it. They maybe didn't have time for it. They didn't have the skills or knowledge to do it. And so it created lots of tension between the children and the family. And again, you know, critical to what I consider parent engagement is parent engagement. I want to be engaged with my child in their teaching and learning as a parent, not mm -hmm. as a pretend teacher, right. right? I don't want to do grade eight math with my kid. That's just explosive. But I do want to bake with my child and <laughs> talk about math then, right? And so, so I think there were wins and losses both, right. Chris. Right. Um, yeah. But again, you talked about mindset earlier. It, it came back to, to what we believed in and what we wanted for one another in that time frame, I think, too. I love, too, how you were mentioning that relationship. Um, I mean, everything is built on that. Everything. You find that if you can have a good relationship or at least some connection with your, you know, your kids, teachers, school, I mean, that's where all the stuff could start to happen. Um, it's the foundation on which you build. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can consciously build those relationships. I think we leave them to chance a lot of time. You know, who do we say hi to at drop off or pick up times? You know, who comes to the conferences that we talk to? But as, as, as teachers, as educators, we can consciously develop relationships, right? Um, I encourage teachers to write a letter home at the beginning of the year and say, tell me about your child. Chris, your, your son, daughter, I'm not sure, has, has this musical interest. Like, tell me, tell me about your home. How do you spend your time? What do you believe in? You know, what, what's so unique about your child that I should know, um, et cetera. What are your hopes and dreams? This is your child's last year of high school. What do you want mm -hmm. out of this year, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, do you know how long it takes us to write a letter? And yet we can, you know, a matter of minutes, maybe even half an hour. Um, and we send that out to everyone. Even if some of our families respond, yeah. think how much more we know, how much more we're connected, how much more intimate our relationships become with that sharing. Absolutely. You know, and especially if we do it ourselves. I, hi, I'm Debbie and I'm teaching your child this year. I have three sons, you know, we live here, we do this, we do that, here's some pictures, <laughs> write back to me. Great right? idea, great idea. And so we can consciously do that without making it one more job or one more pillar of work in our, in, in our job description, right? And, and so that's what I keep saying, how are you building those relationships? What are you consciously doing to do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I mean, it comes, this was a question I wanted to ask and you kind of answered it, but like with the start of a new school year, what are the starting steps 
I mean, I love that idea of, of writing a letter and the parent telling them about their kid. Who knows their kid better? Yeah. Um, what, what, what's the value in starting the school off with getting to know those parents of the yeah. kids that sit in front of you? Yeah. I mean, the research says there's value for everyone, for kids, for parents, and for teachers. I can start my year alone and work through the year, or I can build a team of support for myself and for the kids right from day one. And we all know what it's like when you have that team of support around you, right? Um, so many things become easier. Uh, teachers say, I invest heavily at the beginning of the year in building relationships and knowing my families, because then I can bring their lives, their culture, their interests into my curriculum. I can make it more meaningful. The books I choose to read, the novel studies we do, all can reflect who these specific families are. Mm -hmm. But also in the event that there's a challenge and I need to call you and talk about something hard, we're, we're working from a place of care and respect. And so it's so much easier to say, gosh, this is challenging. What would you do, Chris, at home? What, what do you think I should do? Let's let's figure this out together. And so instead of that hierarchy where both where you feel a bit scolded by your child's teacher sometimes or feel like you're being judged as lacking, it's just a, it's a cooperative problem solving situation. So teachers say invest in the positives to reduce the negatives for the rest of the year. And don't we all want to be in that positive <laughs> Yeah. That positive beautiful phase. way to say it Debbie. Yeah. beautiful way to say it yeah and then you know and then i just think is like who is who are my students this year and how do i make this curriculum engaging and meaningful to them Great. and it's by bringing their lives into it that that they all of a sudden become interested right and parents parents are the key to that right they they have that information and i i don't so so mm -hmm. true so mm -hmm. true Mm -hmm. Well, um, just to tell everybody out there, if you want more of Debbie and these amazing um, shifts in mindset, <laughs> she is actually going to be working with the CLC uh, this year, um, our community learning schools. Debbie, what, what, what are, what are you going to be doing with the CLCs this school year um, here in Quebec? Yeah, it's so exciting, Chris. I have a series of four sessions that I'm going to be doing. So one in November, one in December, and then following up after the break with one in January and one in February. So we're really going to, um, we have about two hours each time. So the sessions will be interactive, lots of practical strategies, opportunities to talk, share ideas, work through challenges and so on together, starting with kind of looking at our own beliefs and assumptions about kids and families and teaching and learning. I think it always starts with what's in our heart. Um, and then we're going to um, move to looking at practical strategies, things that we can do, um, things that are high impact, you know, sort of all the things we could do, which ones are meaningful. And we're also going to be looking at how do you assess where you're at with your family engagement and kind of make a plan. So we'll be looking at and using some rubrics to kind of do some self or school assessment and then build some concrete action steps. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. It should be a, what a, a treat. One. And I hope kind of, you know, it's like a little mini, a, a mini class to, to kind of build from one session to another. Amazing. Well, we are blessed to have you come and, and work with our educators and our CLC um, reps. Um, this has been a real pleasure, Debbie. Thank you so much for carving a little bit of time out in your day. Um, I have so much to think about now. Um, <laughs> this has been a really fun chat, and oh, I love the words that you shared with us. Um, very thoughtful and um, timely. I should say. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Well, thanks for inviting me. This is a passion and, you know, I'm just happy to be able to have this conversation with, with you and with the folks you work with, Chris. Amazing. Well, thanks so much. And we'll be seeing you soon. Talk to you again. <laughs>